we are midway into this program for this year, which is the retreat and the global crusade. Lord, our prayer at this moment that is that you will not leave us halfway in Jesus' name. That just as you started with us, you will see us through until we've crossed all our bridges, all our ri rivers, until we have, uh, we have overcome all our mountains in Jesus' name. And Lord, as a church, as a local church, Lord, I'm praying that what you have for us, Lord, we will not lose it in Jesus' name. Even as we go into your word, at this moment we pray, you will touch us, you will guide us, you will teach us, and you help us to establish everyone you will give to us as a church in this place in Jesus' name. The tools we may need, all the, uh, the, the power, the, uh, the energy, and the skills we will need to establish souls in our midst. Lord, I pray we will, be, we will receive them even as we go through this message in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are dealing with seminar number three. And uh, the topic for that is prospects and a pattern of follow-up and discipleship. Prospect and pattern of follow-up and discipleship. I'm reading from Acts chapter 2, from verse 40 to 44. In Acts chapter 2, verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. 44. And all that had believed were together and had all things common. Follow up is the climax of our evangelistic work. Our evangelistic effort. Our evangelistic task. There are a couple of things to do to achieve a successful evangelism. And the main one is the follow-up that we have to do. The revisiting of the people we have won into Christ that we have to do. It involves deliberate and planned visitation or establishing connection with the converts that we have brought by his grace into the Lord through our outreaches. It could be the outreach of personal evangelism. It could be the outreach of crusade. As this crusade is going on, you invited somebody by God's grace. He was touched by God and he becomes a saved person in the church. You do everything possibly to assure, to encourage, to establish and to develop this person in the newfound faith. This is a newfound faith that this person had gotten himself into. He needs to be guided. He needs to be encouraged. He needs to be kind of persuaded and pushed on by and by until he finds his feet standing on the rock, Christ. No evangelism work is complete without an effective and organized follow-up. In other words, if we don't do follow-up, none of our fruits can we effectively, can we boldly say they are standing. Therefore, follow-up after evangelism, after witnessing is necessary, it's important. In fact, that is what makes the work complete. 
we look at three things. Number one, the prospects of an effective follow-up and discipleship. Number two, pattern for biblical follow-up and discipleship. Number three, pitfalls to avoid in follow-up and discipleship. I go back to number one, the prospects of an effective follow-up and discipleship. The prospect of effective follow-up and discipleship. Now, what is the word prospect? We need to understand. It is the possibility or the likelihood of some future event that, okay, that is going to occur. The possibility or the likelihood that is you can look into the future and you can say, if I am going to do this, then this kind of a result is going to come out. So that is what it means, the prospect of an effective follow-up and uh, discipleship. We've already read from uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 40 to 44. And over there, we found out that, in verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. All these are sort of components that helps the believer, that is the new believer, to be established in Christ and in faith. So, it's very clear here that if those things are not in place, then the, this new person is going to find it difficult navigating his life, navigating his feet, his steps in the terrains of the, of the life of faith, of Christianity. And that is why you and I, it, 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 it has to be pushed on us. It has to dawn on us that we do what we can to make that person who was newly enlisted in the army of the Lord knows everything that he or she needs to know in order to become a faithful soldier, a faithful disciple, and a faithful follower of Christ Jesus. Let's look at some of them, uh, uh, some of them that were done in the scriptures. Look at Colossians. I read from chapter 4, verse 7. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, All my stage shall Tychicus declare unto you. This was Paul talking to the Colossian believers about what he himself and also his fellow laborer, Tychicus, will be doing for them, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord, verse 8, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate, how you are doing in the Lord, how you are bearing up in the Lord, how things are with you in your family since you believed in Christ and comfort your heart in case you are down spirit. I have sent him to help you in all these areas in case you are facing some kind of persecutions from friends, from family members, from neighbors. He will come and give you that comfort in, in case you are having some pains anywhere, in case you are being troubled in any way, whether emotionally, physically, psychologically, monetarily. In any way that you are having any problem, I have sent him to bring you comfort. Verse 9. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Done here in the headquarters. Done here in Jerusalem. Done here. Wherever I am writing this letter to you, Whatever we do, they are going to declare them unto you. And that is what is handed to us as believers, as members of this local church. That when people come in, we open their eyes, we teach them, we direct them, we encourage them, we comfort them. We do whatever will make them established in the Lord. Often, the fruit of an evangelism exercise is wasted. I repeat this, often 
the fruit of an evangelism exercise is wasted due mainly to a lack of a poorly organized and coordinated follow-up. It's unfortunate in your life, in my life, probably, probably don't do anything at all when we get these new people. We as a church, therefore, need to put in place a proper plan, proper program for follow-up. To ensure that all leaders, workers, and members, not some few people, not some selected people, not some people who say, well, uh, this is my field, but every one of us will ensure that all in the church realize the importance from leaders to workers, to members, we all realize the importance and acknowledge the necessity and wholeheartedly accept the responsibility for following up all new converts. It has to, it has to be so with all of us. It shouldn't be one man's job, one man's business. It shouldn't be, ah, she can do it well. He can do it well. But I must stay back. It shouldn't be that way. It is when this is done that many converts or newcomers who are often unwilling to continue with the church will actually continue. If we go to them, we open their eyes about who we are. You know how people think about us deep in the Bible church. For that will be an opportunity for you and I to get along with them, open their eyes, their eyes so that the unwillingness that they have within them will win and uh, will be uh, diminished from their lives. It is when this is done that many converts or newcomers who are unable to gain assurance of salvation during programs will actually gain their assurance of salvation through your visitation, through your follow-up. They will gain that assurance of salvation. And then there are some who panic, making public testimony of the experience that they had had with Christ. It is through follow-up. We will help them to be bold, to be courageous in declaring even in public that I am saved and I'm not ashamed of declaring to you that I am of Christ. And also it will help for those who face strong opposition from family members and friends to stand still, to stand bold and to have backbone and uh, to have their spinal cord standing straight. Just as Pastor was telling us, like Daniel, just stand straight, unbending, unyielding, unwavering, unstoppable. You move on like that. And then it will also help those who are struggling with issues relating to conviction and commitment. See, some people, when they hear the gospel, when they listen to the word of God, they are like, mm, uh, is, this, is this really true? Is heaven really there? Is hell really, is God really going to take us to a place where people will be burned and be burning and burning throughout eternity? They lack conviction. Is it true that somebody really came to this world called Jesus? Is he really the son of God? No, people are having issues with their conviction. Follow up is there to help you and I, help those people uh, be convicted of what they have believed in. Commitment to effective follow up is what is desperately required in all sections of our church and uh, ministry so that we will be able to conserve the fruit. And that will guarantee the consistent and progressive growth of the church. Let me repeat that. If our church will grow, if our church will expand numerically, if we will expand and if we will grow, follow up is going to help do that for us. And it will improve the spiritual health and well-being of our members. 
and avoid waste of souls that are won to the Lord by the church from time to time. So, if we, if we, what, what, what I can use to explain here uh, by, by the writer saying, avoid waste of souls, is that if we take our records, when people come in, we record them on our welcome, uh, newcomers welcome card. We have it there. Now, if we should bring all of them and count them, I believe they are intense if not in hundreds. We will have tens of them, tens of them. But the question is, how many of these people that we have on our follow our uh, new commerce card are in our midst today? How many of them? How many of them? Of all those that you have uh, invited to the church, you have preached to outside, and probably one of these those days followed you here. How many of them can you point to that they are still in the church? You may not get anyone. Just as I may not get anyone. And that is what we are talking about. Waste of souls. Waste of souls. I pray we will no more waste souls in Jesus' name. Point number two. Pardon? For biblical follow-up and discipleship, does the Bible has a laid-down principle pattern for us to? Yes, do we uh, derive any example of how to go about this biblical follow-up? Yes, we have. Let's go back again, chapter two. I'm reading verse 41. Acts chapter 2 verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. About 3,000 souls. Definitely there will be some people who will gladly it's not going to happen that you preach to 10 people of them are going to reject you, are going to snub you, are going to push you out. You may get one or two people who may say, oh, I like your gospel. They will gladly receive your gospel. But after that, what do you do? The Bible says these people will be added to the church. Now, when they are added to the church, what happens in verse 42? Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, it sounds simple. It sounds easier. It sounds just hearing it in your ears. But I believe so many things have gone into it. So it's not just, and they continue steadfastly, as if automatically it happened that way. No. Somebody has to help these people, has to open the eyes of these people, has to encourage these people, has to let these people become aware of their newfound faith that they cannot say, I am born again, I am saved, I have seen Christ, seen Christ or come to Christ and continue the way that they had been living. Somebody had to help them to know that they must continue steadfastly in the doctrines of Christ. It could be the doctrine of salvation itself. It could be the doctrine of sanctification. It could be the doctrine of holiness. It could be the doctrine of uh, faith. It could be the doctrine of uh, God's healing. And it could be the, the doctrine of uh, the last days, uh, rapture, a great tribulation, millennia reign, uh, standing before the, the white throne judgment. It could be any of these doctrines, but they cannot know it if somebody will not let them know that we have all these that you 
as a new person, as a son of God, a newly born again child of God, you must learn. You must know all this. Somebody will have to let them know that persecution awaits them at the door in their homes, at their place of work, among their friends. Somebody will have to let them know. And that person must be you and I, who have known better than them. Look at um, uh, verse, verse 42, again, the last part. It says, Doctrine and the fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They might not even know that they had to pray when they get into problems, into troubles, into difficulties, into hardships. They might not even know that when they are being persecuted, they need not to fight back. They need not to quarrel back. They need, they, they need not to get into altercation, but uh, to pray to God. They might not know that. Somebody will have to teach them. Somebody will have to tell them. Look at Acts chapter 14 verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. What did they go there to do? Did they go for fanfare? Did they go there for vacation? Did they go there to look for a nice restaurant to buy food to eat? Did they go there for sightseeing? Oh, there is a nice uh, place here. There is a park here. There is an ancient building here. Let me go and check it out. Is that the reason why they went there? No. Look at verse 22 in Acts 14, 22. It says, confirming the souls of the disciples. Confirming the souls. That was the reason they went there. Confirming the souls of the disciples. And exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. These are some of the things they went to do. They went there to uh, tell them what they needed to hear as new people. First of all, they went there to confirm them. To let them know that they have come into a proper religion. A good religion. A religion that will take them to heaven. Religion that will give them peace of mind. Religion that comes from God Almighty. The religion that is based on love. Not on hatred. Not on dislike. Not on antagonism. But religion that is based on love. On mercy. On forgiveness. That is what you are going to do to confirm them. And that is what they went there to do. They did not go there to discuss uh, uh, family matters, discuss uh, business, discuss economy, discuss politics. That is not or was not what they went there to do. And exhort them to continue in the faith. They brought them up. Exhort them. They pushed them up. You are able. You are able. Don't be discouraged. You are able. Don't just look down on yourself. You are able. Some people have done it. You will also be able to do it. Exhorting them to continue in the faith. Probably their faith was waning down, was going down, was dripping down. That moment, they exhorted them in their faith. Maybe there was something they were praying or looking up to God for, which never, which wasn't coming. And they were like, ah, what kind of thing have I entered in? What kind of religion have I entered in? What kind of God have I come to believe that I pray to and is not answering me? Probably some were in that situation. Those people, they were exhorted to continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom. You must let them know because some of them, they think, Oh, well, I have come to God and everything is going to be rosy. All people will love me. All people will like me. 
All people will embrace me. Everybody will appreciate me. Everybody will say hallelujah to my newfound faith. But it's not like that. We have to let them know. Because Jesus said everything is given to us plus persecution. Plus troubles. And that is what Arthur, uh, uh, Paul was saying. That through, we must let them know that through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. We're not going to ride in bands to heaven. We're not going to ride in Rolls Royce to heaven. Just, uh, was it two or three days ago, I was looking at uh, some of these new cars, uh, electric cars that are coming. I'm telling you, if you see them, if you see them, you'll be like, wow. Hey, the car doesn't even have the steering wheel. I'm not sure how it's going to be driven, but the steering wheel is not there. And everything is just touch me. You touch everything. The door, you just touch and it's open. You, you touch and it starts. Ah, things are coming on. Things are coming into this life. But why am I telling you this? We are not going to ride in such a car, a luxury car, to heaven. We are going to go to heaven through much what? Tribulation. Much persecution. Much trouble. Much affliction. And that's why the psalmist knew this ahead and said, Though the affliction of the righteous are many, the Lord does what? Delivereth him. And the Lord will deliver you in Jesus' name. Just as he delivered Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, he will deliver us also. Because he wants to get us to heaven at all costs. Why did he waste his son's blood to save you if he wouldn't want you to go to heaven? Why would he spend time, energy, allow his son to come and die? And then when you got ready and you prayed that, Lord, I'm believing in you and in your son. For, forgive me and save me. Why do you think God wasted his time saving you? Why do you think God wasted his energy, his resources in heaven to save you if he wouldn't want you to be in heaven? The Lord will take you there in Jesus' name. And we need to encourage these people that God has saved them to bring them to heaven. And therefore, there is no need looking at all the difficulties they're going through, the troubles they're going through, the persecutions, persecutors are bringing at them. No need to look at all those things. But it's your job, it's my job to bring this message to them. To show them the kindness, the mercy, and the love of God. And let them know that it is even through this persecution that they are really established. As we, we used to hear from our preachers in those days. That you look at uh, these fruits that you put out there in the ground. When they start coming out, they go through all this sun sunshine, they go through the rains, the wind will come at them. That makes them stronger and stronger. And the same thing is with the believer. You will go through them and that's going to make you stronger. Are you going through any tribulation? Are you going through any persecution? Are you going through any affliction? The Lord has designed it in a way to make you stronger. You will be stronger in Jesus' name. I said you will be stronger in Jesus' name. Verse 23 in this act chapter 14. It says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. In follow-up, we strive. We strive to know the stage of our people, of our convent. That is, our task or responsibilities are, the first one I read from Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 again. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you how I am faring, how I am going on in my life. Like this was Paul. Tychicus 
what mention everything unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your heart know your estate so we go there our responsibilities our duty, number one, is to know the state of the convert. Number two, is to reassure the hearts of these new converts. Number three, to re-emphasize and clarify the gospel message in case they had something they did not believe, in case they they had something somebody had come in to pollute their mind in case they had something they do not agree with it they dislike it they don't want to conform to it we go there to make things clearer unto them so we we re-emphasize and clarify the gospel message is Jesus truly the son of God we make things clearer unto them is the Holy Ghost stellar operational today we go there to make things clearer unto them are we really going to be raptured out of this earth we make things clearer unto them is the tribulation after rapture or before rapture we go there and make things clarify clearer unto them and then we show new converts the need to share their faith they must share their faith they must also testify about their faith. Remember that man that Jesus healed, that demon-possessed man who was like of uh, tormenting himself, uh, scratching himself, and uh, uh, enduring himself. Jesus healed him. He wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus said, no, go back to your friends. Tell them what good things how loving the, the Lord had been unto you and therefore we teach these new people how to testify to others about their faith and then we comfort their hearts as I have been telling you in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 22 whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your heart we also go there that is I'm, I'm mentioning some of the things that we need to do we we perfect whatever is lacking in the lives of new converts you can see that in Colossians chapter 4 verse 12 we establish new converts in the faith Colossians 4 12 inform and acquaint new members of the necessity and benefits of fully identifying with the church nobody should stay back home and say I am in the church no Remember, Hebrews tells us that uh, not forgetting the assembly of ourselves together, as we see the day draws closer. And so, if you are still zooming all these days and don't want to be in the church, ah, uh, well, we we'll still provide Zoom, but for how long are you going to Zoom? Those of you on Zoom, do we have some there? Those of you on Zoom, for how long are you going to Zoom? We need to come together. It's time, let's come together, and the Lord will bless us in Jesus' name. So if you find any new person, and the person is saying, well, I will Zoom, I will Zoom, tell the person, no, God did not give us Zoom only. He has also given us a church, a place where we have to go and congregate and share real physical fellowship. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And then we support and succor new believers in any area. We have to support them. It could be financial. It could be uh, material. It could be doing some things to help them. Maybe they are weak in taking care of some things in their in their homes we help them succor them support them integrate the visitors we make sure that they are integrated they are established we can lay our hands on them and say this is a member of this church we shouldn't doubt their membership that is what we're talking about integrate them 
We don't want to doubt anybody's, any member's membership. Does that sound clear? What did I say? We don't want to doubt any member's what? Membership. If you are a member, be what? Be a member. But we have to help them to be members. And I pray we'll all be members in Jesus' name. And then you show them the need for regular quiet time and family devotion. And if you don't do family devotion, you don't do quiet time, one day I will surprise you. What did I say? Those here, I want to hear you. What did I say? Okay. Those of you here, how am I going to surprise you? Did you do your quiet time? Stand up and let all of them hear. Did you do family devotion? You have all these toddlers, children growing up, and you are not doing anything to bring them up, to help them, to establish them, to let them know what life is all about, uh, using the scriptures to, to, to teach them at home. How do you even find out their skills and their talents if you don't bring yourself together as a family and uh, do family devotion? It's not helpful. And if you don't do it, how are you going to teach the new convert, the newcomer? Please, let's wake up before I surprise you. Amen? So that uh, uh, family devotion and uh, by these we promote them. Over, we will promote their overall growth and progress in the family of God. As you are growing in that your family. And you are growing in that your family. I'm growing in my family. Together we come together and the family of God will be growing. Uh, let's look at the last point. Let's look at the last point. Pitfalls to avoid in follow up and discipleship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. A man, a man be found faithful. The first pitfall to to acknowledge and to know is you yourself seeing yourself as a faithful individual, as a faithful minister, as a faithful messenger, as a faithful laborer or co-laborer, as a faithful man in the house of God. Hallelujah. You see yourself and you know yourself that I am a faithful. In fact, you see, nobody will, will see that for you. You have to. You have to. And uh, you can't deceive anybody. But at times, you deceive yourself to think that you are faithful. And that is why it is very necessary for you to be faithful to yourself. Be transparent to yourself. And that is what is going to give you the victory in this exercise that God wants us to have. So, it is uh, required in steward that a man be found faithful. Look again at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. One and two. We read First Corinthians chapter one, uh, chapter four, verse one and two. We are looking at Second Corinthians chapter four, verse one and two. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, what kind of ministry? The ministry of visiting the newcomers. What kind of ministry? The ministry of going back, just as Paul told us that they went to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. That is the ministry. The ministry of going to the houses of the people. The ministry of picking up your phone and calling them in case circumstances does not permit you to go back to their houses. What's the ministry? The ministry of encouraging the new people who have come in. What ministry? The ministry of making sure you help and support 
support and support them to grow the ministry of teaching them all the doctrines of Christ. That is the ministry that the Lord has given to us. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We get tired not. We, we, we slide back not. We get weak not. But, verse 2, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. When we go there, we are not going to be deceptive people, not teaching them what they need to know. Thinking, well, I'm not able to do this. Why must I teach him? I can, if I'm not able to do it, I can't teach. That's why the honesty, the faithfulness, I, I told you earlier, that you must be you faithful yourself. So it's not going to be like, well, I do this. I can't teach him. I can't tell him not to do it. That shouldn't happen. That, when that happens, then there is, honest, there is no honesty there. Let's look at verse 2 again. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, not walking as a con man, not walking as somebody deceiving other people in, in, the, in, in their businesses, in their works, and taking some things valuables from them. That is not who you are. You're not going to visit these people in craftiness. Uh, and uh, at times some people might, might know that a well, that is a wealthy man, that is a wealthy woman. Let me get closer to him or to her so that I can, in a crafty way, get some things from her. That is not the ministry that God has given unto us. The ministry God has given unto us is not with craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully interpreting the word of God to suit our own benefit. That is not we call the spade spade. We call it as it is. We're not going to kind of hide behind anything. Let them know. Let them understand. If it's too hard for them, there is grace. There is grace to soothe the pain that they might go through. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. All things being equal, the right personnel for effective follow-up must be workers and brethren in the house of God. Who, number one, are passionate in prayer. Passionate in prayer. You cannot win. The Bible tells us, Jesus said it, that if a man, a strong man, has captured his her captive and he is ruling over them, if anybody at all will be able to rescue this captive, that person needs to be what? Stronger. He is stronger. He has, he has his captives. How do you get this? If so, free from captivity, you have to be stronger than that strong man. How does the believer become stronger? It is through the prayer and fasting. And that is why, I, if you read Galatians 4.19, Colossians 1, 3 to 4, it tells you that we must pray. We will pray in Jesus' name. And then, faithful and dependable. You must be somebody who, when we give you a card to visit somebody, follow up card to, give, uh, to, uh, to visit somebody, you're not going to put it under your bed and come to tell us that it's lost. You are not going to just look at it and say, what is this? And just uh, uh, kind of uh, push it somewhere. No, you're going to act on it. You're going to work on it. That will make us know you are faithful, you are dependable dependable. And then you'll be fervent and zealous. Fervent and zealous. There is that zeal in you. There is that fire in you. There is that energy in you. You are ready to jump everywhere. You have more cards. You have more visitors that I need to follow them up. I need to call them. I need to help them. I need to teach them. You are zealous and fervent. And you are committed and also consecrated. You've laid down your life. As we saw it 
three days uh, that was last uh, Friday, as we saw it, you consecrate. You lay down your life. Uh, you don't want anything to tamper your sacrifice and your consecration. Then you are discreet. You are discreet. Uh, you are discreet, uh, which means uh, that uh, uh, you are able to uh, to separate yourself, uh, distinct uh, things, and uh, judge them right uh, and uh, act on it. You are wise. Let me put it that way. You are wise. And then you are also loving and caring. You are patient and uh, persevering. You are disciplined. You are composed. You are focused. You are informed and knowledgeable. That is, you know what you are going to teach these people this new convert. You are not going to be a novice who doesn't know anything yourself. No. You have to know it. That is why the Bible study is there. That is why such the scripture is there. So that we will be knowledgeable enough to have enough to teach the people that we are going to uh, follow up. In fact, uh, you will know all the nitty gritties, gritties of follow up. When by the grace of God people who possess these qualities are assigned to follow up new converts, they will be able to avoid the pitfalls that usually jeopardize the follow-up process. Such pitfalls include haphazard and inconsistent engagement with new converts, giving up too soon, too soon. Oh, he's not serious. She's not serious given up. Then some go and condemn them. This is somebody that has newly come to Christ. And you go and condemn them. Ah, you are not supposed to do this. You are not supposed to do that. You are not supposed to do that. We don't do that. Please uh, take your time. Be patient. Uh, the person is born again. There is no sin in his life now. But there are some things he doesn't know. We need to be patient with them and teach them. They won't know everything automatically today. You look at yourself. What you know today. Did you know all of them at the beginning of your Christian life? No, it doesn't happen. We know that salvation will take sin out of your life. You become obedient and you will be able to, we will be able to control you. But you are not going to know everything. Understand it that way. And that is how we will be able to help them. So we don't go to condemn them. And then we are not going to dig into their private matters. No. Personal matters, we are not going to do. If they bring them out, that is fine. But it's not your duty to go and prognose into everything that's going on in their life. Yours is to teach them the word of God. If the word of God convicts them and they bring anything out, you help them out. Then uh, you are not just going to run your mouth, lose talk and lose. So these are pitfalls. Uh, and then we are not going to be worldly, obnoxious when you are going to visit them. That is when you, you bring uh, the, the, your, your Christmas dress. That is when you bring uh, your fashionable dress. No, it shouldn't be that way. And then we are not going to be hypocritical, pretentious in this position. And uh, my time is up. Uh, but I need to mention this one. Uh, you have everything in your outline. So you can go back to them and then kind of look at them and uh, read them. But let me say this one. Visiting the opposite sex at odd hours or in, or in secluded places in the name of follow-up is not a good thing for any child of God. And so... We must take note of all these. And in case you have a convert as, as a man, male, you have a female uh, woman convert, you can visit her with the same thing, vice versa. The same thing is opposite. Uh, you have an opposite sex as your convert, you can go the first time with, uh, with the other sex, then you hand him or her over to that other sex so that uh, follow-up will continue. We are going to stand up at this time and we are going to go to the Lord. We are going to pray. Uh, first of all, we are praying that God will give us the heart of an evangelist and also the heart of a follow-up person.
let's pray let's tell the lord lord help us with this we have been failing woefully in this if you need to ask for forgiveness yes you can do that lord i'm sorry for all these years that i've not been doing what i are supposed to do here am i i am asking for your forgiveness but henceforth give me that energy give me that power give me that understanding give me what it takes to take these new people into heart to have zeal and to be to be energetic to move up and down making sure that God him making sure that these people that God has given to us will give I uh, will give their lives to God and be